I'm looking for someone. Looking? Found someone you have, I would say. Hmm? <laughs> it was 1980, and most children from 7 to 13 were Star Wars gurus. We watched the holiday Christmas special in 1978. We celebrate a day of peace. Stop that, stop that. You're not going into a song while I'm here. Most of us, including my eight-year-old self, read the novel Splinter of the Mind's Eye, and if there was anything on TV like the making of Star Wars, a toy commercial, we watched it meticulously. New boss, alien bounty hunter. Not available in stores yet. Free with four proofs of purchase from any of the Empire Strikes Back action figures. Offer expires May 31st, 1980. Most of all, we had the toys or trading cards and we knew every name from Death Squad Commander to Snaggletooth. We even knew about a character in Empire Strikes Back named Boba Fett over a year before the film came out. And we memorized the backs of the figure cards or the booklets from vehicles. When we went to the theaters and the preview appeared, this was the moment we all asked the same question. And who she is going to end up with is still anybody's guess. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, Luke is more devoted to her, I think, than Han Solo is. I would probably describe Han Solo as the cynical mercenary space pirate with the cream filling, you know. He's a nice guy. She's really a chump if she goes for Han Solo. And if that wasn't enough, the new wave of Star Wars figures appeared, and any kid at that time went nuclear in their enthusiasm. There were new vehicles, new characters, new outfits, new 12-inch, and more merchandise like candy head toppers, Burger King glasses, the new trading cards, bowls and mugs. There was a Burger King contest with stickers and cards after the film came out, new shirts, lunch boxes, and bed sheets, yeah. new books from pop up to sticker to coloring, puzzles. And I'm spent. Yes, this was the film that changed it all. And for a very awkward, socially struggling boy, Star Wars was my lifeline to relate to others, especially after a messy family time that caused us to live in low-income projects of Norwich in Toledo, Ohio during May 1980. It was not the best place for a confused boy to grow up, but Star Wars inspired me and it was a tool to help me communicate with kids my age and gave me the escape I needed to deal with difficult situations at home. So when The Empire Strikes Back was released on May 21st, 1980, my mother knew the only thing I cared about in the universe was seeing that film, and during its opening week, we went to the Showcase Cinemas on Secor Road between Central and Monroe, and I was floored by the film. Right after getting out of the theater, I had to get a Lando figure, who turned out to be my second favorite character of the trilogy, just behind Luke. When the film opened, there was little competition for the movie. Friday the 13th and the nude bomb was still making money from May 9th while fame Carney the long riders and humanoids from the deep was released the week before on the week of Empire's release a few films thought they had competitive power to come out the week of Star Wars 2 and they were die laughing with Robbie Benson the gong show movie and Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which actually did great with 45.6 million. Yet Empire had nothing to worry about because its dominance was assured thanks to the young audience salivating for it. And when the film was viewed, we wanted more, and thanks to the continuing merchandise for the next two years, we got more in the form of cards and figures and that coveted ad at I never got as a child, but don't you worry, when I got older, I got my ad at. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, sorry about that. Anyways, if you haven't seen our first video on the production of this film, you know making it was a disaster for delays and production issues, but the final product was glorious, 
and it's touted as one of the greatest sequels of all time. And why is that? Well, we're going to take a look at it and a lot of things behind the scenes. In our channel's fashion, we'll do a deep dive into this film, and there is a lot to discuss. At the start of the film, the tone is cold and desolate, and it represents the journey that will be frigid and lonely for all the characters involved. Now, it is true the Wampa scene was written specifically by Lucas early on to explain possible scars Mark Hamill had from his car crash in January 1977. Yet, for some reason, Lucas is sometimes cagey to admit it, even though his original story notes for Empire Strikes Back specifically read, Luke, crash in beginning, scar on face. Lucas even mentions this in his commentary for Empire Strikes Back. Mark, at the end of New Hope, had been in a car accident, and I knew that uh, Mark was going to look a little bit different than he did in the first film, but my feeling was that there's some time has passed. They've been in the rebellion, they've been fighting, that sort of thing, so the change was justifiable. But by the end of the commentary, he downplays the impetus of writing the scene. There is a scene in the beginning of the film when Mark gets beat up by the monster, which helps even more. But that really wasn't the main emphasis of why we wrote the monster in the beginning. As for the specifics of Hamill's car crash, there is debate on what happened specifically, and sometimes stories don't mesh with the crash because Hamill himself seemed to downplay the event in an interview during the 70s. I, in early 77, before the uh, film came out, my car skidded and I broke my nose against the steering wheel. And it was sort of forgotten. They set the nose and uh, the movie came out. Nobody noticed, you know, that there was anything wrong. And I never really thought about it. And over the period of years, uh, it's built up into having my face reconstructed with plastic surgery. Mm. Mm. But it wasn't really too bad and you are... Despite this interview, Hamill later said in the making of Empire Strikes Back, I'd fractured my nose and cheekbone. My plastic surgeon took cartilage from my ear and built up my nose. I wallowed in self-pity. I felt, at best, that all life had to offer was Peter Lorre's old parts. Gary Kurtz stated, they operated from about 9 in the morning until about 4 in the afternoon. I saw him on 4.30 and Mark said, Oh, I'm sorry I got delayed. As soon as I get out this afternoon, we can go. He evidently had no idea what he looked like. While Hamill was evidently wallowing in self-pity, according to his own words, Diana Highland from the TV show 8 is Enough came in to visit him. She told him point blank, you're letting yourself down as well as everyone around you. A few days later, Highland died, and Hamill realized he did not even know she was terminally ill while he wallowed in his own self-involvement. Hamill said it was Highland who shook him back to reality. Back to the film, an interesting setup is that the rebels just arrived at Hoth. These things are noted because they say things like they are trying to adapt their craft to fly in the cold. Are the speeders ready? Uh, not yet. We're having some trouble adapting them to the cold. It also explains why Luke and Han are out in the cold because they are setting up sensors to detect incoming dangers. Sensors are in place. You'll know if anything comes around. Commander Skywalker reported in yet? No, he's checking out a meteorite that hit there. The tragedy of all this is that just when the rebels start to get a foothold, they have to flee, thus making the rebel peril quite harsh when considering their living circumstances. After Han leaves the command room, he tries to manipulate Leia romantically, but in the original script, this conversation was a bit different. There was originally a subplot to make Han more fleshed out as a character, in which the Rebellion needs Han to contact a huge galactic trader who can help the group with supplies and contacts. It just so happened that Han is the adopted son of this person, but they had a falling out. Leia pleads with Han, and eventually he relents to their pleas. Of course, this did not end up in the final film, 
but it did give some depth to Han that none of the classic films ever provided, beyond him being a roguish dude with a heart of gold. Some of the extended scenes that were late cuts were great between Han and Leia, because Han told her she wasn't even a woman and as cold as the base. He could have helped her out with this, he claims, but he has to leave and she pushes him right back. The chemistry was firing on all cylinders for these scenes, as you can see. I'm sorry, but you're as cold as this planet. And you think you're the one to apply some heat? I could, but I'm not really interested anymore. Further deleted scenes hinted a wampa fight coming, and then it would cut to R2 running from a wampa in the late cut. Now before we go into the official deleted scene for the Wampa Raid, it was a little different in the bracket draft. When Luke returns from the Wampa, he warns the rebels about the creatures and they have not encountered them yet even though there have been some sightings. Instead, the Wampa attack would occur just after Luke's recovery. The creatures would show themselves by invading the base in force and working with intelligence by destroying their generators and machinery. Even Chewbacca would get into the fight with the creatures and go hand to hand with one of them. The rebels would actually signal a retreat due to the creature's strike, and while they are retreating, the Empire would arrive to make it worse. What was filmed was completely different than Brackett's draft. The Wampas would attack just after Han and Leia's conversation. The creatures try overrunning the base, but shooting it just didn't work. One of the reasons was that the arms for the creatures were swung more like bats than hands, and the visuals did not mesh. Worse was that the effects just didn't come off and their movement was not convincing. During this scene, the creatures' invasion would fail. Some of the creatures were trapped in a room where a warning label was placed over the door to keep the creatures detained. After the scene was shot and failed, the storyline changed so that the rebels knew about the creatures even before Luke and Han's first scene, thus making Luke's warning about the creatures not needed later. Once again, plugging the fact that the base is new and everyone is trying to acclimate, we come to the scene where 3PO and R2 are talking about Princess Leia's room. Apparently, 3PO, in his wisdom, turned on the heater and melted the room, and R2 is mocking him for it. It's a quick dialogue moment that offers a lot of levity in the early part of the movie. Hey, I didn't ask you to turn on the thermal heater. I merely commented that it was freezing in the princess's chamber. <laughs> but it's supposed to be freezing. Are we going to dry out all the clothes? I really don't. With this scene, I'm going to once again plug the non-canon radio drama released on February 14, 1983, with oversight by Lucasfilm. It really offers a lot of insight into many scenes during the first act of the film, starting with more details over the droids and Leia's quarters. It also goes into detail when Han is irritated that Tex will not help him work in the Falcon after all he has done but base setup is overwhelming everyone. It also explores Luke and Han having a conversation overnight in the makeshift tent Han makes after Luke is rescued from the freezing wastelands of Hoth. It's really good and entertaining stuff, although John Lithgow's performance of Yoda is really off. However, Brock Peters once again rocks it as Darth Vader. Hamill, Billy D. Williams, and Anthony Daniels return to voice their characters and it's a must listen for fans and easily found on YouTube. Now we have to touch on the special editions and of all the classic films Empire Strikes Back is the least invasive visually and adds what I think it should have. Although I always prefer classic special effects warts and all for nostalgia reasons I do like what they did with the Wampa and some of the footage on Cloud City However, Empire's Special Edition was the worst when it came to dialogue changes. I will go over these dialogue changes when we get to the relevant scenes, because there are some that really annoy me. 
One interesting scene is when Han went to get a Tauntaun to find Luke. You can see alien blood splattered on a wall in the background, and a Tauntaun is on the ground with 2-1-B inspecting it. Now the blood on the wall and the damage in the room clearly telegraphs that the Wampa attack was canon, unless someone wants to argue that rebels were target practicing Tauntauns, spraying their blood on the walls and destroying their own base. I have heard someone stating that if you search the room, you can see a glimpse of a dead Wampa, but I never saw anything definitive in this scene. A trading card from the Topps first series of 1980 suggests that the Tauntaun 21B is inspecting was Luke's. I guess the Wampa was eating another Tauntaun in its den. If the card is accurate, it suggests the Wampa dragged the smaller feast, Luke, to its cave while leaving the bigger meal, the Tauntaun, where it was killed. Despite what the card says, some have noted that it was just a dead Tauntaun while others attest it's a casualty of a Wampa attack. I will let you decide for yourself what you think the case is. A nice treat in the film is the appearance of John Ratzenberger. You should know him for his role in Cheers years later, and if you don't know him from that, you should recognize his voice from almost every Pixar movie before 2020. As Luke is going through back to recovery, there was some unused dialogue with the heroes and Irvin Kirshner, who spoke for 2-1-B. However, the scene didn't add anything to the film in the long run, except for the expression from Han's face after a great line from C-3PO. And do hope he's all there, if you see what I mean. The most unfortunate that Master Luke got short circuit. Mm -hmm. When Luke recovered from the ordeal, there was a face mask prop that was originally used, but then cut. But the big scene that was cut was when Luke and Leia was going to kiss while Luke professed his love for her. In the theatrical cut, there was only the kiss Leia gave Luke and none of the romantic stuff. However, in the official deleted scene... We have Luke talking about the idea of never seeing Leia again, and he wants to say something to her very seriously, which is easily implied as love. This is concreted when they move in for a kiss, but C-3PO interrupts them. I might never get the chance. What? Tell me. If we dig into the original script, the tone matches the deleted scene, even though there is different dialogue. Luke says he wished he could take Leia somewhere safe, and then he says he loves her. There is a moment where they kiss, but then she rejects him, much like Padme tried with Anakin, as she states she has too many responsibilities. As you can see from Brackett's script, Luke is very passionate. Now remember, at this time, Leia was never meant to be Luke's sister, as we have covered all scripts before the release of this movie. From interviews before Empire Strikes Back, Lucas and Kurt stated that Luke's sister was the core of episodes 7, 8, and 9, and that she was in another galaxy. Lucas's story notes confirm this further when he wrote that his lost sister is in fact a trained Jedi somewhere else. In 1980, it was not weird that Luke loved Leia. In fact, everyone wondered who she would go for. And I was strongly in the Luke camp as an 8-year-old. When I played with my figures before the film came out, I always thought Luke and Leia was in love. Oh, the innocence of childhood. Must have been that kiss for luck. Another thing I will mention is some photos of Luke and Leia on the set in romantic poses. I can't find much information about these photos, and Luke would have only been in his Hoth gear before Luke is attacked by the Wampa. It is quite possible that such photos were fake-out images, or film seems to trick possible spoilers of the film into thinking Luke 
hooked up with Leia. It's most likely these are just publicity stills. Whatever the case, I thought it noteworthy to cover these pictures, whether they were filmed or not. It is then that Luke says he's planning on going to Dagobah, and Leia is upset he is planning on leaving her too. She continues to push the Wampa plot by saying this. Calm down. Tell me about Han. Oh, he's got to pay off that criminal he's in Hawk to. Job of the Hut. You know, I could get more loyalty if I went down the hall and recruited some of those ice creatures. Although Luke was rejected, Treat Williams was not, and he came to London with Carrie Fisher during the shoot to be with her. Treat got in costume with the blessing of the producers and is one of the shots in the interior of Echo Base. I personally never identified Treat in the film, and it's possible his scene was deleted, but John Morton, who played Dak Raltar, said this about it. Well, Treat Williams decided he was going to come and hang out on the set, which he did, and he appeared in those Ice Planet scenes as one of the lieutenants or officers in the Rebel forces. It would be nice to know specifically where he appeared in the background, but as of yet, it's still a mystery to many like myself. The good thing is that there are many pictures of him in costume as well as him messing around with Carrie. An early story problem was to figure out how Luke would find Dagobah. Since Alec Guinness was not likely to return to his role, it was originally conceived that Luke would find a message from Ben, and in the original script, it was in the form of a memory chip hidden in his lightsaber hilt. As you can see in the original script, C-3PO thinks he broke Luke's lightsaber. Closer inspection reveals it's a memory crystal. After Guinness agreed to return, this story element was dropped, and the film is better for it. Another unused shot was where Han is yelling at Chewie and Leia shows up. I'm not sure where this would have fit in the film and was best left out. Punch anything! Problems? Thanks for your concern. When Rykan sends Han out to deal with the probe droid, he says, Send Rogue's 10 and 11 to Station 3A. Once again, this is a nod to Lucas's THX 1138. I love finding these Easter eggs in this film, by the way. After the probe droid is destroyed, the Rebellion knows their goose is cooked, but in the original draft, Vader found out where the Rebels were by a traitor who was seeing strange things at the Hoth system and told the Empire for reward money. It's good they changed this because it would have diminished the long reach of the Empire in this film. On the way to get the Rebels, what was also in the early draft was when Vader talked about Skywalker to one of his officers. Vader muses over past betrayals after mentioning Skywalker's father. For the theatrical cut, Vader killing Ozzel is completely logical, and the surprise of everyone around Vader, wondering if he has the power to do this, makes sense if you understand the character from the 1977 film. I cover this in my Star Wars video, so if you don't get what I'm talking about here, go back and watch that video. Although Vader was not always intended to be Luke's father, the completed arc of the character is really impressive when putting the prequels into account. Now the weirdest toys made for Kenner figures in 1981 and 82 were called mini rigs and as a child I never found much interest in them because they were not represented in the film. However, in production videos, you can actually see one that never made it into the final cut during the Rebel preparation for the Imperial arrival. It may not look like the toys, but it was a mini rig of sorts. One of the things that makes Empire Strikes Back so engaging is the Empire. They are so threatening and methodical. The film also understands this as the first 40 minutes is nothing but the Rebellion evading the Empire and then getting decimated by it. What increases this is Kirshner's understanding to evolve this by dramatic preparation rather than the fighting itself. Here's what Kirsch had to say about it, and I agree with it 100%. The preparation for a battle is what makes the battle work. The battle itself, you expect. You expect the action, you expect to see a lot of violence, but the preparation 
gives you the buildup, the emotion to be interested in it. Another nice touch was that Wedge returned in Empire, creating more continuity to the classic film. Another similar continuity thread that extended into Return of the Jedi was the ATST Walker or Scout Walker. You can see glimpses of these in the Battle of Hoth, but most remember this vehicle from Endor in Return of the Jedi. The final deleted scene concerning the Wampa story thread is when Han and Leia were fleeing the base. On the original preview for the film, 3PO tore a warning sticker off the door where Wampas were detained, and ignorant snow troopers would then open the door and one of them would die. Another deleted scene had General Veers dying when a snowspeeder kamikazes his vehicle into the walker. The scene is pretty cool, but I always like the idea of Veers out there because he's still a tactical threat to the rebellion. But that's just a fanboy's desire. In the early cut, dated October 17th, 1979, there was a scene where snowtroopers managed to succeed in blasting the Millennium Falcon's hyperdrive before being killed by the guns. Thus, when Han tries to jump to light speed and says, it's not my fault, he's right. They had fixed it before the attack, and it was taken out, unfortunately. This would have been a nice touch if left in the film. The asteroid chase is a beloved cinematic scene, and the grace of the Falcon in such scenes have always mesmerized me. There are small details, and one of them is when a TIE fighter is struck by an asteroid. You can see the pilot spinning out of the craft. For now, we are at the end of another video. Baba said there's my budget shows. Baba said they'd take me anywhere. Of course, Baba used to beat me with rubber hose, call me Dude, hard. please stop. Stop, okay? My apologies for my harsh voice as I had just had a bout with COVID for several weeks and it affected my voice. But that didn't stop us from keeping videos on schedule. We're so glad you came and please subscribe as it really helps the channel grow.